Okay, well, it's uh, it's great to have you here, Stephen Travers. Um, uh, for those watching, this is uh, one of a short, um, a small number of, uh, of kind of videoed podcasts that we're doing for this season of the Guardians of the Flame podcast. Um, and it's great to have Stephen Travers with us. Stephen, uh, we're going to hear a bit more about his life. Um, uh, but today in Ireland, he is a man of peace. He's a man that... Uh, is a kind of passionate advocate for truth uh, in a post-conflict society here in Northern Ireland. Um, and as someone who's really contributing something very significant, uh, I think, in this island. And of course, one of the reasons, sadly, why his voice is so significant is, is because of the events that happened 44 years ago, um, uh, around about the t just when I was, shortly after I was born. Um, it, I hope that doesn't make it feel old. <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, but they were tragic events. That it was one of the the Miami show band massacre. The the bombing was one of you know um, one of the uh, just one of the horrific bombings that occurred during the troubles. Uh, it was a an act of injustice and it was an act of murder. And um, fortunately, you survived, but your your friends uh, didn't. Uh, and so I suppose in this interview today, we, we just want to hear a little bit about, you know, a bit of your backstory before that bombing, uh, the events that occurred that day in 1975, and then where we are today in 2020. I think around the world, like people listening and watching this will be in different countries of the world. Some of them will, will know a wee bit about our history and, and even that particular incident. Some people will know nothing about it, but these kind of things happen all around the world. And so in one sense, what we're looking at is universal, you know, I mean, these injustice, covering up truth, um, those things happen wherever we are. And how do we react to that is, is I suppose, part of what we want to deal with today. So thanks, Stephen, for being here. My pleasure. Do you want to just start by... Um, you're from Carrigashur, is that right, in Ireland? Tell us a little bit about that place. <laughs> well, we forgive you for the way you said that, there, Frank. Uh, it's yeah. Carrig and Shure. It's, oh, yeah. it, it, it comes from the Irish Carrig and Shure. Carrig, actually, uh, quite significantly in my life, Carrig means rock. Mm. So the rock on the shore, mm. uh, and the shore is Ireland's second large, largest river. There's, you've got the Shannon, then you've got the shore. So, uh, and... In my part of the of the world, it's uh, Carrick and Shore. The the town itself is is in the valley of Slievenamon. So uh, people who would be familiar with the Irish song Slievenamon, and um, I often say that I was born between two of the nicest songs ever written, Slievenamon and the Rose of Moon Coin, mm. because Slievenamon is to the north of the town. In fact, I could see it from my mother and father's bedroom. You know, mm. if you. Look out in my parents' bedroom, you could see Sleeping Them On, and um, which literally means the, the hill of the women. Mm. And uh, then to the south, going down to towards uh, Watford, is uh, Moon Coin, which is actually in County Kilkenny. So Carrick and Shore is in South Tipperary on the borders of Watford and Kilkenny. And again, if, uh, if you know anything about uh, Gaelic sports, which I'm sure a lot of people will. Mm -hmm. We uh, know absolutely nothing about football, mm -hmm. but we produce the best hurlers in the world. <laughs> Is there? Right? Yeah, yeah, world champion hurlers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can imagine, uh, so Tipperary and yeah. Walter and Kilkenny. Um, uh, yeah. So they were the big things in 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 my life when when mm. we were growing up. Um, uh, sport and the other great thing that we had in uh, Carrick was um, was music. Mm. And for a town its size, it was about 4,000 people uh, population when I was growing up in Carrick and Shore. Mm. And I think, I, I think it punched well above its weight mm. because we produced one of the world's biggest folk groups, uh, mm. the Clancy Brothers. Okay. Uh, and I have to say that mm. they got a little bit of help from Tommy Makem from, mm. uh, from yeah. Katie and Katie. County Armagh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they were, uh, you know, we were very, very proud of the the, mu the musical mm -hmm. sort of heritage that we yeah. had. They went on to play coast to coast in America on the Ed Sullivan Show, and mm -hmm. the, I think Bob Dylan acknowledges uh, mm -hmm. Liam Clancy as being mm -hmm. the, the biggest influence uh, as a folk singer storyteller. Wow. 
so storytelling uh, through the music the, mm. and uh, and the sport, they were the big things. Um, and I always like to, you know, to think that uh, in some way I carried on the, mm. that tradition from the town. That everybody yeah. was really, really proud in town when I got the job with the Miami. Right. It was a big deal for everybody. Yeah. You know? yeah. So um, before we talk about the, the Miami show band, the, just the... Um, what was it like for you kind of at the start of the troubles um you were much further down much further south yeah. were you in any way what was it like for someone living in Tipperary like kind of Tipperary was it you know um were you aware obviously you're aware of what going what was going on but did did you have any kind of sense if it was close to you or did it feel far away or yeah it was uh, uh, the uh, the north North of Ireland may as well have been the North Pole. Mm. Um, we were, you know, completely uh, away from that. I suppose, I think in a way it was uh, the people in the in the South, probably an inconvenient truth, but when you think about it, there must have been some kind of an embarrassment there that they did, you know, because mm -hmm. the people in the North, especially the nationalists mm -hmm. in the North had been jettisoned mm -hmm. uh, at the treaty and we don't mm -hmm. want to get into that because it's a, Interest issue, but um, so they, I, I imagine, to a great extent, as the troubles broke out, people were hoping that it would go away and that it wouldn't, mm. uh, you know, it wouldn't be something uh, that would develop like it did. Uh, I wasn't, no, I wasn't aware. And when somebody mentioned the troubles um, uh, down our way. Uh, they normally refer to the troubles that were there during the either the the War of Independence or the um, mm. or the Civil War. Okay. So okay. Th they were called the troubles. They were called the troubles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, Those uh, events the, of nineteen eighteen to twenty one, twenty three. Yeah. Which yeah. we're about to enter into the commemorations now. Right, that's going yes. to be a, yeah. a um, hard one to navigate because. Uh, yeah. Uh, but hopefully we'll get through that and 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 do it in a. Some sort of a graceful manner, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, we're in this. I suppose we're in this period for about ten years in Irish history, where, like, calling it a decade of anniversaries, where it's like every year yeah. is a hundred years since some big event happened. Uh, mm. You know, a hundred years ago that really shaped the next century of Irish history. You know, so yeah. Um, so uh, now I grew up in a <laughs> when I moved here as a kid. The idea of show bands wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, I suppose to go back to the early seventies, show bands going was kind of like going to like a disco, or a, it was a a night out. It was a night of dancing. It was f fun. What mm -hmm. was what was it like to? What was it? Was, it was more than that, John. It than was that. yeah. It was. And there were these bands that were people loved, and obviously yours was the the preeminent one, really. Um, let's 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 um. The show bands were were uh, they were uh, a phenomenon. Mm. Um, uh, insofar as I, um, I I could say, show bands played um, the uh, theme music to Ireland's adolescence. Mm. I, that's that's probably yeah. uh, um, correct to say it like that. You can imagine Ireland was uh, was just sort of coming into its own. It was, it was post war. Um, there were there were um, it was very hopeful. Uh, mm -hmm. Ireland was beginning to to find its mm -hmm. feet, and I'm talking about the uh, the Republic, really, I suppose, but also the the, the North as well. Yeah. You know, they were, yes. both were yeah. developing, and uh, the so South and the Republic at that mm -hmm. stage would have been trying to catch up mm -hmm. with the North because when if you drove into the North, um, you mm -hmm. you knew you were on better roads, and mm -hmm. you know it was like it was mm -hmm. something to aspire to. Um, um, show bands. Uh, were great uh, for a number of reasons. When you look back on it, it was it was the golden age of, uh, uh, for Irish musicians because uh, never before or ever since uh, were there so many uh, musicians in full time work. Mm. Now you can imagine that you know it's not a it's not a big country, and yet there were six hundred and fifty. Um, fully professional bands registered right? with the Irish Federation of Musicians, the union. Wow. Now, you consider uh, 650 bands and they were normally at the beginning, say, mm. from the from the from when the show band 
phenomenon really took off would have been around the very early 60s, mm. 62, about coincided with the same time as the Beatles happening and, you know, on the, mm -hmm. uh, the whole Liverpool explosion. And, yeah. and, um, but a lot of the big, big acts that we would have, you know, we would have got the records of Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley and all of those people, mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't tour in Ireland. Mm -hmm. It probably wasn't worth their while. But Ireland had the confidence, and I wish it had this kind of confidence mm. again. It had the confidence to grow its own stars mm. and to have its own super superstars. Mm. So um, what happened uh, originally was there had been dance bands and where you got guys sitting down on chairs and um, playing their saxophones and reading the music mm. and looking at the music as opposed to engaging with the people. Mm. And um, there was a... Um, now it's people argue which of the bands did it first, but there were certainly two bands. One was the Clipper Carlton from Straban mm -hmm. here in the north, uh, and they decided to um, to engage with the audience. Stood up, took off the dicky bows, dressed in so far as they could in a modern way, kicked away the music stands, and they sang popular songs mm -hmm. and put on a show. It was a um, and that's where the, the it came okay, from, you know, a show through. a show band, uh, yeah. and then of course uh, they were pretty seasoned musicians even when they started, mm. but they were excellent, they were top class, mm. and uh, then other bands uh, started to started to copy them. Mm -hmm. uh, the Clipper Carlton uh, came down to Cork to play, and um, they were a sensation. So mm. people like Brendan Boyer and Tom Dunphy and people like that who were went on to become the Royal Show Band. Um, they were working in the in the paper mills in Watford and mm -hmm. they saw this and so they, mm -hmm. and Brendan Barr was literally our Elvis Presley for years. Yes. Uh, I was uh, very fortunate to have played with uh, um, mm -hmm. with um, Brendan mm -hmm. um, a number, on a number of occasions. Mm -hmm. But um, it developed from that. And when you think about it, uh, there's a, we had a bit of fun the other day, we were talking on um, about the fact that uh, uh, the show bands could uh, use a hundred watts, a hundred watt PA mm -hmm. system, to draw in three thousand people. Mm -hmm. And today, the uh, the bands use three thousand watts to draw right. in a hundred people. Yes, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. so it's it's. Um, but times were different, and yeah. there weren't that as many distractions then. Right. You know, today you've got they've they've got uh, many choices, but mm. the show bands uh, could turn up in a originally in a Commer van, like a minibus or a, later on in the Ford mm. Transit van or something like that. And mm. in the middle of nowhere, somebody would uh, put up a, a marquee, a festival, mm. a, a big tent. And the band's local lads mm. could draw two to 3,000 wow. people on, uh, you know, at any of the And festivals. so the Miami, you were, it was actually called the Miami, as it was now kind of known as the Miami Show Band. But you no, it was the other just, way around. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, all the bands were show bands, uh, all of these bands. Be and they were distinguished by the fact that they were like the groups in, in England, mm -hmm. like the Beatles and the Stones and all those. Mm -hmm. Only they, the, they used a brass section to mm -hmm. great effect. And mm -hmm. I remember some years ago, uh, I don't know how many years, I'm not great with dates, but 10, 15 years ago, I remember I had a, uh, one of our bands, we, I had a, an agency and one of our bands was on tour with Simply Red and I said to Mick Hucknell at the time, your lineup is exactly like mm. the show band, you know. Right, like, yeah. You can imagine uh, bands like Otis Redding and people mm -hmm. like that. Uh, mm. um, that's, that's what a show band sounded like oh, with the brass okay. section and the punchy brass. It was, it was, it was okay. a great, great sound, yeah. Wow. Um, later on, we dropped the show band from, uh, from the name. Okay. And so then you, again, after, that, after the incident, then we, they brought it back from... I don't know, the, yeah. for whatever reason. But uh, mm. it was a pop group when I joined it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you were playing regularly, like every week or f several times a week? Uh, I, I, I started while I was in school, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, not being uh, the best hurler uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, playing hurling and not being mm -hmm. the best hurler by a long shot or anything mm -hmm. like that in school. You know, everybody wants to, wants to shine in some way. And mm -hmm. I just discovered I had an ability to play the bass guitar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, um, it just seemed to get better. It was the easiest thing I ever did in my life, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't believe that anybody would actually pay me for mm -hmm. playing the bass, you know. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was that easy. Mm -hmm. um, 
lots of other things I couldn't do. Yeah, I couldn't tie my shoelaces properly, <laughs> but I certainly played the bass. Um, and uh, one of the great things about a show band is that you could join a show band and there was, you know, and and you're playing with fellas twice, three mm -hmm. times your age, you know, mm. if you can imagine. Right, uh, yeah. So you learn from Experience these people. Musicians, and it yeah. was probably the best the best apprenticeship any mm. musician could mm. uh, could could have. Uh, later on, years mm. later, I, I remember playing with, uh, I was producing uh, the great Henry McCullough, who was Paul McCartney's guitar player in Wings. Mm. And Henry had played all over the world with Hendrix and mm. you name it. He's, he was, if you look at the footage of uh, Joe Cocker in Woodstock, mm -hmm. um, a little help from my friends, that's Henry mm. with the long hair singing. Okay. And playing guitar, right. he's a lead guitar player. So uh, I was producing Henry there some years back. He's got rest of him, he's dead now. But and uh, I asked him one of the questions that uh, that um, uh, I asked most of the guys that I was producing. I produced people like um, um, Eric Bell from Thin Lizzy and mm -hmm. Johnny Fien and mm -hmm. all of those guys. And I would always ask them after we finished, you know, if you could relive a day mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. um, what day would you choose out of your entire mm. life? And you can imagine somebody of Henry's stature. Or, and I expected him to say, you know, when I joined Wings or mm. Mm. his girlfriend, uh, when he was uh, with Cocker, was, uh, was uh, Janis Joplin. So any of those things or playing mm. Woodstock. And what he said, uh, I always remember, he, we were at dinner when I asked him and he, he leaned back in his chair and he looked up the ceiling and he closed his eyes and he said, ah, oh, he said, I can see it now, the day. He said, I'd love to be back there. Mm. He said, um, it's a sunny day and I'm sitting on a wall, he said, and I've got the old piece of wood beside me. And the old piece of wood mm. was his guitar. That's mm. what he called it, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a lovely Gibson 335. Mm. And he said, I can see it now. He said, um, he said, and Every few minutes, he said, I'm looking down the road to see if the Sky Rockets show band is coming up to pick me up on the mm -hmm. way to bring me to the gig. Wow. So of all the things that this man mm. had done, mm. he would have gone back wow. to play in a show to band. Play, play in show bands. And yeah. people like Rory Gallagher played mm. in the Impact show band and the wow. Fontana show band, and he learned mm. his chops there. And uh, mm. Van Morrison is played in, in, mm. in a band up in the north uh prior called, to them kind of what was it called it was called it was called um the, the monarchs but having mm. said that there was also a monarchs mm. in, in limerick mm. as well but he played in them and mm. van morrison didn't even sing george jones was the Is singer that right? yeah Is that right? so all of these guys mm. they learned their trade in a show band yeah. you know so many of them amazing yeah so i mean i suppose what you're describing is um is is this kind of proliferation of Irish musicians, show bands, and what I suppose, uh, given our interview, the context of our interview is amazing, is that at your gigs in the north here, you would have had Protestants and Catholics coming, and in fact, in your band, in the Miami show band, were Protestant, Protestants and Catholics from the north and the Republic. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, religion or politics didn't enter you into just it. just transcended that kind of... We didn't know we were transcending at yes. all. We did, you know. It was, uh, uh, you join a band and uh, I was aware, I was mm -hmm. the last one to join that particular iconic mm -hmm. uh, um, version of the, Maya, the Miami mm -hmm. show band. And people often ask us, you know, well, you know, why was it? I was in America recently mm -hmm. uh, doing some talks and uh, this man, he asked me, he said, you know, how come an Irish band mm. is called after the, some place yeah, in America? Yes, yeah, yeah. Which is, uh, I suppose, a, a good question. And the reason was that in 1962, well before I, I was only 11 in 1962, but in 1962 when the band started, mm. um, you know, uh, international travel wasn't a common thing. You know, mm. people didn't go, they didn't even go to Spain mm. on their holidays yes, or yeah. anything like that. They certainly didn't, if they went to America, they went to live and probably most cases mm. didn't come back. But um, so they were looking through a magazine and they were looking for something glamorous, mm. sunshiny and yeah, yeah. something that they could uh, call the band. And one of them spotted Miami on mm. the thing and says, you know, that looks like a good place. Let's yeah. call the band that. We yeah. put palm trees on the van and all that. That's the reason why it was called that. Okay. Um, and that was basically uh, um, a Dublin band at the time. Mm. Uh, the original singer with the Miami show band was a man called Jimmy Hart, who, who's mm. living in Australia, but he wouldn't go professional when they decided to go. Mm. He wanted to continue with his studies. So they got this 
young fella called Dickie Rock, who mm. had been playing with a band called the Melotones. And uh, Dickie's a fine singer, very distinct type mm. of voice. And uh, um, But they split in 1967. The band mm. split. Uh, mm. There was some sort of acrimony there. And um, they were the some of the original guys went off and formed a great band called mm. the Sands. Okay. And uh, the Miami then did the Miami management did a very very clever thing in '67. Mm. They went out and they they basically raided the best of the young groups, the beat okay. groups at the time. Mm. And one band that they particularly concentrated on was a band called the Chosen Few, and they had. Mm. Two great, uh, great um, artists in there. Fran O'Toole was only mm. 17. Okay. And, I, and Paul Ashford, the bass player. So they brought them in. Uh, Fran was a, an exceptional talent. Mm. And Paul was a great, a great bass player as well. So mm. that's what they did. So they basically gave it a whole new lease mm. of life. They got Des Lee from, um, from a, a, another band. He had, he was, he's from Belfast and um, got Brian McCoy from. Mm here in the north from Caledon in County Tyrone uh, uh, mm. had been playing. So they, they basically went out and did a scouting exercise and, and mm. brought these lads in. And uh, because they brought guys in from the north mm. um, and um, there was, uh, they never never considered mm. religion as yeah. to, be, you know, to be a factor in this or, yes, or, yeah. or, and when I was in the band, I never, ever, ever heard uh, any discussion on politics mm. I never heard any discussion not that they avoided it mm. it's just that they had no interest in it yeah. or uh, or even in the troubles at the time mm. and looking back on it uh, I honestly think that they were a great uh, all the show bands whether mm. it was also the Nevada show band or mm. the Dixies or any of those big bands or and the little bands they were doing something absolutely wonderful they were they were a healing agent mm. Uh, among mm. the best of the mm. of the you know the um, of the emergency services, mm. really, because they were going into into uh, ballrooms all over the country, mm. all over the north, uh, and sectarianism was left outside the door, mm. uh, and you know you see some maybe some Catholic lad saw a Protestant girl and. Nature took its course, so mm. it was. You know, we were sort of basically homogenizing the, mm. the. Yeah, you were imagining, or you're living in a world that that, incidentally, did transcend kind of the divisions that people want to put on things. And yeah, there was no divisions in yeah. uh, in, in, in the band, and it was afterwards when the lads were uh, after they were well dead and buried uh, that somebody had mentioned that you know their religions or whatever. But it didn't matter to but me. it was never really even an issue yeah no yeah. no 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 yeah. why would it be yeah you know, the bit the, the currency is you know can this guy play or, yeah yeah, yeah. It, you know that's yeah got you the job yeah so um so maybe we can talk about what happened um in 1975 you would have been doing a, a, a bunch of gigs yeah. um and in that particular night in july uh it was bambridge yeah, we were playing. It's Bambridge, a small town. I mean, it's uh, we're recording this in Ross Trevor on the Irish border. Um, some people call it the British border, but um, it, it's uh, you know we're um, an hour south of Belfast. Bambridge, half an hour from here. Mm -hmm. Dublin's an hour to the south of us. Um, uh, Bambridge. There was a it was a, a gig like any other um, concert. It was. It was. Um, we like to have one night off in a week. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't always possible. Um, so we we had played. Normally, it might be Tuesday. You probably get a Tuesday because we played regularly in Dublin on on Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a famous gig called the TV Club. It was in Har Harcourt Street, where I think the Garda part of the uh, Garda. It's not the headquarters, but they've got a big, big building there now. I think that may be on the site of it. But um, it was called the the TV Club. Uh, maybe that sounded glamorous, but on a Monday, regular Monday night, nothing mm. special. We would put two and a half thousand people into that on a Monday night. Mm. So, um, give you the uh, sort of gives you an idea of both how popular the band was and how popular mm. dancing and and the uh, mm. and and the show bands were at the time. Mm. Um, 
the context uh, really needs to be, you know, we need to explain why something like this would happen. Mm. And uh, at the time, um, there was uh, the conflict was 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 uh, raging. There was a lot of people being killed, and uh, the uh, the British uh, security forces weren't happy mm. about the uh, about the. Um, what they thought was uh, um, uh, a lax sort of security, security on the southern side, southern side of the border, mm. um, and there was a reason for that. It was true, you know. You could the minute you drove into the north, you you were liable to be stopped uh, mm -hmm. by um, either UDR or some parachute regiment, or I don't know. I don't know one regiment from the other, but I remember Scottish accents and English mm. accents and black and faces and all that kind of mm. thing. Um, uh, but the minute you drove south, you hardly stopped at all. Mm. And the reason for that was because the uh, TDs, or as you call them in Britain, the M members of parliament in mm. the south, were loath to uh, disrupt the lives of their constituents. If mm. they did that, you know, they wouldn't be elected again. Mm. And uh, most of the people along the border areas from the south mm. would have crossed the border twice, three times a day, maybe mm -hmm. to get groceries or cheaper mm. petrol or whatever. So it would have been cheaper in the north. Yeah, you know, at the been, time yeah, you would have. Yeah. Uh, and um, so rather than disrupt that, uh, you know, they would, uh, they didn't want stop and search, mm. they didn't want stringent security checks, mm. whereas uh, this, which would have been the case in the north. And um, they complained about it often enough and they just, so they, they came up with a, an excellent plan, I have to say, you know, you, you look at it dispassionately, this uh, to to enforce or to force the uh, the, the southern authorities to enforce strict, mm -hmm. strict security. They decided that let's show them, you know, uh, uh, let's let's frame somebody mm -hmm. as terrorists so that they, they mm -hmm. will have to enforce it. I mean... Mm -hmm. They had a reason for doing it because if the IRA committed some atrocity in the north, once they got mm. south of the border, they were fairly mm. safe. They could get to safe houses mm. in, for maybe in Dundalk or on yeah. uh, over on the Donegal side or wherever. Mm. So there was there was a point to it. So there were political discussions about how do we kind of compel the Irish government yeah. to to up their security. Yeah. And <laughs> so the idea was, yeah, let's let's fl frame the most. Uh, trusted commuters, mm. people who are certainly uh, are going up there on a regular basis, uh, crisscrossing the border, not only, you know, if they could manage to frame just the most trusted, even the most mm. loved people, then the whole world would, you know, would side with the British and say, well, who mm. can you trust if, if these guys mm. are, um, are part of this, uh, helping the IRA or whatever. Mm. So they came up with this brilliant plan and uh, we were the ones that they decided on, that mm. we were the patsies. Uh, mm. They were going to sacrifice us. And the terrible thing is, yeah, uh, you know, that they they didn't, they mustn't have put a whole lot of thought into it when you consider that the band was a mixture of Catholics and Protestants yeah. and North yeah. and South. And mm. uh, so we were on our way home from mm. gig in Banbridge and we had played on the Monday and Tuesday in Salt Hill and Galway at the Galway races mm -hmm. in uh, in Sea Point, and we had we were going to play Banbridge on the Wednesday, and so our night off that week was going to be Thursday. Mm. So we're looking forward to the night off. Yeah, and um, on the way home we were stopped at a checkpoint, what we thought was a, a an army checkpoint and. In fact, it was an army checkpoint. I mean, people often use the word bogus. I, as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't bogus. Now, with the information we have now, mm -hmm. it was it was the real thing. Mm -hmm. And we knew the procedure. I was the least experienced in the band, but the lads knew the procedure. Uh, you, when when the red light flagged you down on the road, you you slowed down. You uh, turned off your headlights. Mm -hmm. You just kept the side lights on, and you turned on the interior light, mm -hmm. and you knew. Uh, in most uh, circumstances that there were guns trained on you from both sides of the so with the interior light on you were a, you mm. were a target mm. so you certainly behaved yourself and uh, mm. but normally 
you know, when Brian, we were in the personnel van, we didn't carry any gear except mm. a couple of guitars and a saxophone. And uh, normally, you know, Brian would just slide there. It was a Volkswagen minibus. He would slide their window open and uh, soldiers, whoever they were going to be, especially if they were UDR, which was made up of people from the north, mm. um, they would know us, you know, mm. and uh, or Brian would say the Miami or show them a band card and there was a chit chat, you know, people mm. would say, well, how did the gig go? Or yeah. sometimes they'd ask you for mm. records or tapes or whatever it was mm. or... So that was a normal, I mean, I remember coming when I moved here in the 80s, that was a, a normal thing. You drive around anywhere in the north, mm. you would just be driving along the road and there would be a red light, there'd be an yeah. army guy up ahead or police, the RUC, the police, which was what the police were called back then. And they stop, ask you for your driver's license, where are you going, what are your names, you yeah. know, trying to figure out who you are. And so that was a, a normal part of life. And especially 1975, that was at the end of... The, the bloodiest period in, in the Troubles, you know, those first six years where yeah. there were bombings all over the place and shootings and no one, I suppose, knew what was going on. And you were from f far away in the Republic where this that wasn't a normal thing to do, but you yeah. kind of joined this band. This is, and you were told this is just what happens and mm. you kind of trusted the system, I suppose. I've heard you, the way you described it is yeah. almost like this trust of, well, they know what they're doing yeah. and... Yeah, I was brought up to uh, to to trust the a uh, uniform, I, as I've said, on countless occasions. You know, I saw a uniform. I thought, you know, you're safe. But it was an adventure for me. Uh, the lads, the other guys in the band, certainly the lads who'd come from the north, mm. they were well used to it. They knew the drill. They, you know, they didn't have to be told. There was no reason to be to to be suspicious or anything like that. Uh, the guy who stopped us. Um, he told us uh, to get out and there was a car coming up behind us fairly quickly. And uh, I remember Brian looked back at, at us. Um, I had been, I would normally travel with Brian. I would sit, Brian McCoy, I'd sit up beside him. He was our trumpet player, but um, he would drive the personnel van as well. Mm. And uh, being a bit of an insomniac, Brian and I would you know, chat away while the others had slept, but it was a relatively short journey from Banbridge to Dublin where we were all based. Mm. So he, um, I moved back into the back seat. The lads were playing cards, and I wanted to talk to Tony, uh, Tony Garrity, the guitar player. Uh, I don't know what we we're talking about. Probably guitars or something like that. And we would mm. normally have uh, um, some rock music blaring mm -hmm. in the in the mm -hmm. in the on the on the tape system mm -hmm. and the car. And that particular night on the way up, we were certainly listening to uh, Edgar Winters. Uh, White Trash, it was an album called Roadwork or Roadworks. Uh, mm. That was the big thing for us that particular week. And uh, it's a great album. Mm. Um, so there was nothing, you know, we'd mm. just switch, switch off the, the tape. You knew what to do. And this man asked us to get out. And Brian said, well, there's a car coming up. Can I pull off the onto the side mm. of the road? And it was a small dual carriageway. Mm. And uh, we did. Um, he said, yeah, pull it, pull in there. And we all got out. And uh, the soldiers that were there, with they had machine guns and uh, big adventure to me. And uh, I could see about five of them. And they told us to put our hands on our heads just mm. to face the ditch. I was from here to, to where you are from, mm. the, from the van, mm. from the back of the van, uh, the minibus. And we had our hands on our heads. They put a, a hands on your head like that. It was like something mm. you see in the movies. Mm. Yes, yeah. Big adventure to me. Uh, I was in the middle. There was our our drummer Ray Miller had gone home because he went home to Antrim, so he didn't travel down to Dublin with us. Okay. His parents lived in Antrim. So it was five of us, and uh, I was in the I was in the middle. Uh, Tony was on my left, and uh, Fran was on his left. Uh, Brian was on my right, and Des Lee was on my uh, on his right. He he was almost touching, able to touch the van. Mm. I remember they were friendly and they were mm. sort of joking and saying, yeah, I bet you lads would rather be at home in bed than mm. being here on the mm. side of the road. And Fran was always the uh, the witty fella. And he said, uh, I bet you'd rather be at home in bed than sitting in a ditch because they were mm. sort of crouched yes, down yeah. and, and with their machine guns and very relaxed. There was a man taking mm. our names and addresses and things like that. And <clears throat> there was one man who seemed to be in charge. 
and um, then there was uh, I heard some noise at the back of the van uh, because uh, the Volkswagen the the engine is in the back uh, of a Volkswagen mm-hmm. minibus, but there's a little shelf. So on the on the shelf at the back above the engine, we carried my guitar, my bass guitar, Tony's uh, Gibson, and Desert Sax sometimes. And uh, I heard them opening the little flap on that, mm-hmm. and so I became concerned about the about my instrument. Uh, the reason we d- we carried our instruments we, we didn't trust the roadies were always, mm-hmm. you know, they sort of throw the mm-hmm. stuff in, and they were they wouldn't be careful. I wouldn't let my guitar to anyone anyway, but um, and neither would Tony. And I thought they were might damage it, so very naively because I wasn't used to it, mm-hmm. I took my hands down. I just walked a couple of steps over and I said, can I help you? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's probably in hindsight, there's a silly thing to do, but, and, um, one of them said to me, uh, what's in that? And there was a, I had a little case, like an old fashioned school case beside mm-hmm. my guitar and unusual for a bass player. There was effects pedals mm-hmm. at the time. Bass mm-hmm. players didn't, uh, didn't use effects pedals. Although I read, uh, a few years ago that Bootsy Collins who played with mm-hmm. James Brown said that he was he said he was using a, a wah-wah pedal or something like that in mm-hmm. 1976 well mm-hmm. I have news for Bootsy I was using 74 <laughs> so, right. uh, but uh, yeah. um, so he asked me what was in that case and I mm-hmm. said uh, he said are there valuables in it mm-hmm. and I and, and again in hindsight now he probably thought the money from the gig was in it you know mm-hmm. but we didn't handle the money. The roadie was going, had, mm. would have that. Mm. I said, no, it's just effects pedals. And he hit my hand. Uh, he knocked it down and he turned me around and he hit me very hard into the back and mm. sort of winded me and knocked me back into, into line. Mm. But this time I wasn't in the middle. I was now second from the van. Desley was on my right and Brian mm. was on my left. And uh, just then there was a, a man... Um, mm came on the scene, whether he got out of the car that was coming up behind us or whether he whether he was already there, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was, when he made his presence felt, uh, the guy on the sitting down got up and everybody became very professional. There was no more joking or mm-hmm. chit chat. This man had a distinct English accent. Uh, I was well aware of the English accents because I had spent, when I left school, I was a trainee broker at, at Lloyd's in the city of London. And uh, so was, you knew the mm-hmm. different types of, and this man was very posh English accent and he was most definitely in charge. Uh, I've always said he was an officer and we now know he's an officer and we now also know who he is mm-hmm. with recent uh, uh, evidence that, we, that we've been given by the Ministry of Defence, British Ministry of Defence. And he took charge, he was in charge and... Uh, what we didn't see, what I hadn't noticed, mm. was that there were two men placing a, a a bomb underneath the driver's seat. For years, we thought that the bomb had gone off in the back that these guys were rummaging in. But um, they were putting the a, a bomb under the driver's seat, and it was a 10-pound bomb, and uh, it was je- jellignite, so it was commercial explosive. Right as opposed to you might hear of a 100 pound or a 200 pound bomb homemade with fertilizer and things mm. like that but well, this was this was the stuff you blow up mountains with mm. and uh the plan was that they would say thanks very much for your cooperation off you go we wouldn't have known about it and maybe well according to forensics now it would have been 10 to 15 minutes we would it would have gone off mm. because they know that with the timer mm-hmm. And, um, and you'd have been close to the border at that time, and nobody would have known about the mm. about the checkpoint. Mm. So, you know, people would have, would have been, said they would have been long gone. And, they would have been long gone, and we would mm. uh, we'd go down in history. And this, for me, is the terrible thing. You know, everybody has to die at some stage, mm. but uh, we would have gone down in history as terrorists mm. carrying bombs for the IRA. Mm. We, uh, our families would have would have been mm. the families of terrorists. My father, mm. who was. My hero, my mm. my mother, uh, my wife, my young mm. wife, only married a year. Mm. She would have been the wife of a terrorist. And you wonder how mm. many times this has happened that mm. they got away with it. But um, unfortunately, there was, uh, for these two poor men that were putting the, 
the bomb underneath the driver's seat, uh, uh, they either tripped the mechanism the, or else it was deliberately set to go off. There's a, a debate about that, but it blew them to pieces. Mm. And um, I remember reading the autopsy reports on them. I mean, the destruction. And, and the reason I mentioned that is because in TARP, uh, Truth and Reconciliation mm. Platform, that Eugene and I started, uh, which is very successful now, as a, as a deterrent, as a witness mm. impact statement. Mm. Um, you know, we we do speak uh, in graphic terms mm. about, you know, the destruction and mm. the, uh, the the effects of of uh, of bombings and and mm. and, and shootings and uh, and I remember reading the autopsy report uh, of these two unfortunate men. Mm. Uh, one was Wesley Somerville, the other was Harris Boyle, members of the UVF. The mm. uh, they were also members of uh, the UDR, mm. uh, which is the largest regiment in the British Army. They were working in collusion with the. Mm. With the with the security forces, and one of them was uh, identified by a small piece of skin from the back of his neck that was sort of mm. basically decapitated, and and uh, they found arms out in the field and stuff like that. And when the bomb went off, killed those poor men instantly. I was thrown into the air because I was sitting, I was standing very 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 close where you're sitting there, mm. and uh, it was. Almost instantly, I could hear the, the gunfire because these men started to fire, uh, the men with the machine gun started to fire straight away. And uh, I tried to run, but I, I was in the air. And I remember everything being red. Mm. It was like, it was, that was the impression I got, almost like mm. you were in a sunset, a deep sunset. Mm. Now, it was a beautiful morning. It mm. was uh, 31st of, morning of the 31st of July. The weather was particularly hot. And... I tried to run. The strange thing uh, that I didn't say for years, because I mean the whole macho thing, the Irish lads growing up, or mm. but uh, as the first thing I did was I shouted for my mother, mm. uh, some kind of a primal scream or whatever mm. it is. Yeah. Uh, and then I remember feeling the minute I said that, I felt instantly, instantly ashamed of myself mm. in the middle of all this thing going on mm. my only concern was did anybody hear me mm. call for my mother mm. you know mm. uh, and I started to go down through uh, down, down through the ditch there was a, about three meter drop into the mm. field mm. and uh, so I was up in the air tried to run but I couldn't get any porches because my feet were off the ground they tell me I was shot mm. then uh I uh, shot with a what they call a dum dum bullet. I'd never heard of that um, until that night, and it entered my right hip. Mm -hmm. And uh, a dum dum is designed to to explode on impact, mm. and it exploded into sixteen pieces. It did a lot of damage inside, and then the rest mm. continued through my left lung and out under my left arm. So it did a lot of damage. Uh, and as I went down through the the hedge, the ditch into the field. Mm. It was almost like I was in slow motion. Mm. Uh, well, I felt I was, and I could I had such a heightened sense of awareness, maybe it's adrenaline or something, mm. that I could count all the leaves and brambles and bushes and everything that as I passed on, you know, mm. I could almost count them. Mm. And then I hit the ground with a, a heavy thud and immediately two other people fell on top of me. Mm. Uh, Des had been blown through the, 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 to the right and down into the ditch. The other four of us had been uh, had been blown in a, uh, almost directly down into the field, and mm. uh, the people that fell on top of me, Tony and Fran and Brian, they fell on top of me, and uh, one of them they immediately got up, but I was a dead weight and, and I had been shot, so I, I couldn't move. And one of them um, put put his his hands under my arms and dragged me mm. out into the field, and. Uh, for years, I couldn't figure out who that was, but I had an experience in Warrington, which uh, had a uh, a lot of it came back to me. I'll never forget it. I was uh, it was a b bad experience, and I'm quite sure it was Brian McCoy. So here you've got mm. here you've got a, a lad, a Protestant lad, a trumpet player, and he's from you know his father is in the Orange Order. Wow. 
and he's dragging a Catholic from Sao mm-hmm. Tiberi out away from mm-hmm. this in the midst of all of this and this the screaming and shouting and there's the obscenities were were mm-hmm. I'll never forget them the soldiers mm-hmm. uh, our lads were just terrified and here he is dragging me out and while he's dragging me to save my life mm-hmm. he got shot in the back of the head and in the back and the arms mm-hmm. and the hands mm-hmm. and they murdered him beside me mm-hmm. uh, and immediately I, I, I dropped um I couldn't, I couldn't walk. And uh, they caught Tony and Fran mm. and uh, they murdered them very quickly. I remember, but I remember them begging for their lives and mm. Fran was a particularly good looking lad mm. and uh, they shot him 22 times and about, uh, so about seven of those I think were in the face. You can imagine what the, the damage that did to him oh. to the extent that... And he's one of the most... Potentially could have become one of the most well-known Irish yeah, musicians. and a lovely fella. At the beginning of his life, at the yeah. beginning of his career. So, so the slaughter went on and, as I say, one of the, the abiding memories, two things I remember was, uh, was um, the, the smell of hot blood. Like, um, mm. Because when when shooting, as Eugene Reevy often, when he's explaining his experience, you know, steam comes off. But he's, mm. Actually, the the bullets cook mm. the mm. flesh when mm. they're when they're shot into it. Mm. it was, I remember the the smell of that, and the obscenities of the soldiers, mm. the swearing, the cursing, uh, and then they proceeded to walk around. One of them in particular was walked around the. Uh, kicking the bodies and making sure that mm. people were dead. Mm. And even though they were certain that they were dead, they would fire into the body, into mm. the dead bodies. Mm. And they came over and started to kick Brian, who was beside me. And uh, clearly he was dead. Mm. And uh, I was, I pretended to be dead, so mm. I kept my face to the ground and I was waiting for this fella to, to fire into me mm. because he had fired into Tony with mm. his revolver. And um, I thought that my, my dilemma was, do I get up? Do I stand up? Mm. Do I beg for my life? Mm. Or do I stay where I am? And luckily mm. I, I decided not to budge. Mm. And I was determined if he fired into me that I wouldn't cry out. I was you, trying to process all of this mm. stuff. Mm. And I heard a, a voice from the, from the road, shouted down and said to... Uh, Come on, I got those bastards with dum dums. They're dead, and that's mm. the first time I ever heard the term the dum dum. Yeah, right. and I, actually, I thought when I heard that, I thought I, that's why I don't feel any. A dum dum is a dummy bullet. Mm. It's not real. Yeah, yeah. Because I couldn't. There was no mm. pain, mm. and uh, they left. And Des had been was li- was lying in the ditch, hide, hiding, and uh, that was now on fire. So he was he had a mm. problem. But the fire was reaching him. And uh, they left, and he he start, he called our names, and none of the lads answered, and I answered, and I thought it was quite clear. And again, it's an Irish thing, you know. You're not, you don't want to make a fuss. I remember he called me, mm. and he said, "Are you okay?" He said, "Steve." I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Are you okay?" Mm-hmm. I believe it or not, I said, "I'm grand." Mm. You know, it's it's an Irish thing, mm. Uh, mm. Um, mm. and. He got onto the road and he eventually, there was a lot of carnage on the road and um, a, a lorry stopped a truck and uh, refused to take him, thought he was perhaps part of this, yes, whatever. Yeah. And then a car came along with two young people, brought him into Daisy Hill Hospital, or sorry, brought him into Nuri Police Station. Mm-hmm. And would you believe that the police in Nuri Police Station never took the names of the people who brought him in? Mm. Uh, don't they don't have the names and mm. uh, like it was so lax yeah. and uh, he was there for best part of an hour and I was crawling around the field and I was sort of mm. standing up and falling down and mm. trying to tell the lads everything would be all right and we'd go home soon and mm. you know and because you you're not really aware I, yeah. I couldn't there was no blood it was uh, I couldn't there was mm. uh, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me mm. but my stomach was extended. Mm. And uh, so I'd crawl and then I'd fall and I'd walk and I'd stand up and eventually the police came came in. They sent a helicopter in first because they thought the bodies would be booby-trapped. Mm. Well, that's what they said. But I was there for the best part of an hour before they brought me out and brought me to 
eventually brought me to Daisy Hill Hospital where my faith in humanity was restored within 48 hours. It's just the most marvelous people, you know. Wow. And I, I remember thinking when I woke up that I felt sorry for the people that did. I, I thought they've gone home and said to themselves, what mm. in the name of God are we after doing? Mm. And that I thought they'd feel ashamed. Mm. But uh, we know afterwards, uh, you know, that uh, the leader of the Glen Ann gang, which was the gang responsible for it, who were, that he killed somebody the following day. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Wow. He committed a uh, murder the next day. So that was the madness that was going mm. on up there. And I don't want that to happen to anyone else. Mm. Um, uh, certainly, if we can do anything to... Uh, to make sure it doesn't happen. And I yeah. think what we the work we do with TARP, with the, uh, Eugene Reeve and myself and Joe Campbell and all of the other lads, there's about 120 of us all, you know, all told mm. within the organisation. And mm. one, uh, we've got great mentors, people like Seamus Malm and Rory, Dr. Rory O'Hanlon and people like mm -hmm. that who are wise people and put mm -hmm. us on the right track when there's certain aspects of the running an organisation that we don't understand or that we're not good at. We, we're... Eugene and I often say we're guerrilla warfare. We get out there, we get things mm. done, but there yeah. are other things that you have to do. Mm. But uh, we um, we think that TARP, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Platform, is a deterrent. Is mm. uh, you know, it's uh, when people hear these stories that mm. it it completely sort of explodes the myth that mm. you know that there's some kind of glamour mm. or uh, in, yeah. in 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 yeah. killing people or in in this kind of conflict. Mm. So it, I say we we do we do a tremendous yeah. work with that. I am very, yeah. and it's taken the place of the music for me. It gives me a sense of worth. Yeah, and we can come on to that in in just a second. If we, so just to kind of relive the um, the reality of what happened was that you were one of the most popular show bands in the country. Thousands of people would come and hear you. Mm. Somehow the British government or elements in um, in the security forces intelligence felt like let's plant a bomb on the Miami show band that will force the hand of the Irish government to be stricter with security. But And so the Glen Ann gang was formed, which was this where the government colluded with loyalist paramilitaries. Um, I remember reading that the arm of one of the, the guys who planted the bomb on your van had a UVF tattoo on it. Yeah. So, we, so then they know it was... Uh, UVF is, was obviously one of the biggest paramilitary gangs in the country, but there was this kind of collusion with the government. The Glen Ann gang was formed and committed a series of bunch of murders, um, including U Eugene Reeve is here actually <laughs> in the in the background, and um, his three brothers were killed um, by the same guys, essentially, you know, the, the same yeah. gang, um, and. Uh, and then you survived that. Life went on, and the troubles kept raging on for another twenty odd years. Um, when I've heard you tell the story, the Truth and Reconciliation Platform, which you've set up with Eugene, is is really a remarkable thing. I mean, I've been involved in a, two or three of the events that you've run, both here and in on Kuhn and in different parts of the country. Uh, you know, when I've been there, you've done, you've had four people who were victims during the troubles get up and just share their story. They sh you share your truth. Um, and it's from people from both sides um, and, uh, or from different sides, different, you know, different experiences. And it's a really remarkable evening. And without fail, everyone that comes is just awestruck by not only the tragedy of what happened, but then also then your commitment to, um, your commitment to truth, but you're also your commitment to reconciliation and building a society where this kind of thing wouldn't happen anymore. But it took a while for you to kind of, I suppose, go through that process. And when I've heard you at one of those truth and reconciliation platform events, you kind of describe how you kind of went back to life after that for a season and you tr just tried to kind of live a normal life and rebuild somehow and it but it was some years later where it kind of hit you in a deeper way of what really happened can you describe yeah, a little uh, bit of that was well, two things before before we go on to that I, I just have to emphasize that 
that there were, um, you know, we speak about collusion. There were some policemen there mm. in, involved in the investigation of our, our incident. And they were some of the bravest people I've ever come across. They mm. tried their level best to mm. apprehend. Uh, well, right. they did apprehend them, but mm. they were uh, frustrated by their superiors. And again, mm. now we know that this was. This is why I say it's systemic. Mm. With regard to you know getting your trying to get your life back, um, uh, you don't have to die to lose your life. And this is mm. something that we say all the time because you know. Uh, um, it, it, if if your life changes to a great extent, that's that life gone. Mm. That you know, that um, mm. and somebody say loses a husband or wife, father or son or daughter, whatever it is, uh, that that life is gone. So so mm. you, you don't have to actually die to lose that mm. that particular life. My life changed. Uh, to, uh, I didn't realize at the time. Uh, I thought that I could get my life back, and you're right. You know. Um, mm. Uh, you can imagine even say, for instance, the, 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 the wives and families of the people who did this, their lives changed mm. to a, a huge extent. The mm. people who were, were eventually sent to jail, their lives changed. Mm. And uh, um, you can't, you know, but feel sorry for these people as well, because the madness at the time mm. was driving all of this. I, uh, I was very keen to, to, uh, to get my life back. And we had... Um, we had a small claim, just to, to illustrate this, mm. uh, we had a small claim uh, when we did put the van back on the road, we got new guys in and, mm. and uh, we thought, you know, people will move on. Um, but we had this, uh, I had to attend a psychiatrist f uh, to be assessed for mm. this small claim, which was to mm. cl claim the instruments, uh, the price of our instruments back. And you, it's a beggar's yeah. belief today, you yeah, know, you yeah, know yeah, that... Yeah. Something like that would have gone on, but um, I remember going to see a psychiatrist, and uh, I I didn't want to be there, you know. And he mm. would say, you know, well, how are you today? And I say I'm grand, and he'd mm. say, well, what um, you know, uh, uh, what do you, well, you know, where do you think we're going with this? And mm. and and are you feeling better? And are you getting it? Mm -hmm. And I used to think, look at him and think, you know, this guy needs a psychiatrist. I don't need a psychiatrist. This fella is mm. is more, you know, and he, my I don't have a mm. problem. This is mm. what I would say to myself. And I would say mm. to him, uh, I went to a gig. On the way back, I was shot. The lads were killed. I, I lived. Mm. Yeah, end of story. Let me just get on with, mm. with my life, you know. And, mm. and uh, after a number of sessions, he said, you know, he said, this isn't right. He said, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, uh, be, it's, you, you should you should you should be mm -hmm. more traumatized. Mm -hmm. And he uh, so he said, I think I'm going to give you sodium pent pentothal, which was uh, the truth serum, basically mm -hmm. James Bond stuff, where you inject somebody and in a controlled atmosphere, mm -hmm. you you talk it out and you unburden yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I said, look, you do what you have to, but. Eventually, he said, after about the best part of a year, he said, okay, he said, maybe you're one in a million, one in 10 million people mm. who can deal with this. He said, mm. but it is unusual. He said, I won't give you that. He said, but I have to warn you. Mm. He said, in six months' time, a year, five years, 10 years even, mm. he said, the, the wall might fall on you. And I, I always remember that, the, the term he used, the wall might mm. fall on you. So I was happy to be to be rid of this fella. So mm. I, I got on with my life. We started the band, we reformed the band and I, I realized very quickly I wasn't getting my life back. You know, mm. people didn't know how to process us. They didn't know how to deal mm. with us. They, they didn't know whether to shake hands, get our autograph or genuflect. Mm. I mean, mm. it, was, it was unprecedented mm. and we didn't know how to deal with it. So very quickly, I, I, want, I told the management, I want to leave this. I just want to get out and go back mm. and get my life. Never got your life back. And that's mm. what I'm saying, you know, mm. that, that you don't have to die to lose your life. But mm. one of the things, the terrible things that happen um, when you become a victim. No, I refuse to believe I was a victim. I said, I'm a survivor. Don't mm. call me a victim. Mm. I'm a survivor. But one of the things when something like that happens is that, you know, when when you discover you've got a gift, like uh, as a musician, it, it gives you a great sense of worth. You stand mm. out in the crowd. Mm. You're a, you're a, one of my favorite songs of all time is the Eagles' "New Kid in Town." And when mm. you do, when you 
you mm-hmm. become this sort of bit of a star in your own little mm-hmm. uh, ho- hometown. Mm-hmm. You know, people notice you. You're, whether you know it happens to guys mm-hmm. when they become good footballers or hurlers mm-hmm. or whatever as well. You, you know, you get this sort of this mm-hmm. mini celebrity and mm-hmm. thing. So you get a sense of worth, and it and it, and it does. It's good for you. Good for your ego. And when I when that happened to me, and I realized that I was no longer the the head hunted bass player that I had been. Mm. Uh, that I, I wondered why, you know, I wondered. Mm. And the reason was that all the people who wanted me to join their mm. band uh, before I joined the Miami, they no longer wanted me. They wouldn't have me because, mm. you know, you, you couldn't, people couldn't come out on a Saturday night to enjoy themselves and look up at the stage mm. with uh, some famous band and there you've got this fella reminding mm. the whole world of a terrible mm. tragedy. It's not mm. what you do on a Saturday night. Mm. So, from that day, from the 31st, on the 30th of January, or 30, 30th of mm. July in 1975, I was, I was one of the most headhunted bass players in Ireland. Mm. The following day, up until this very day, I have never, ever been employed as a live musician. Mm. I've played on all their records, I've played in their studios, mm. but I am not one that mm. they want on stage because mm. we... It's not just a stigma; it's a stigmata. Mm. So you're, you're, so you have to learn to live with that. Mm. And all of a sudden, you know, you you find something that you are good at, and mm. a truth and reconciliation platform gives the victim this renewed sense of worth. Mm. Uh, and uh, first time I ever spoke in public was with the uh, Michael Gallagher, the mm. OMA support group. Mm. Uh, Michael lost his little son, Aiden, in in the OMA bombing. And I got confident. Uh, mm. he, he asked me to speak, and then I began to speak in Europe and the mm-hmm. uh, RANN, the Radicalization Awareness Network, um, uh, conventions and universities and all of that. I began to think, you know what, I'm actually quite good at this. Mm. Uh, and I got this almost like a musical arrogance that we mm. had when we were mm. young, you know. Mm. And uh, I was speaking at a, an event in Amsterdam one day, I think it was, again, strange enough, it was like a, a big gathering of psychiatrists, or psychologists mm-hmm. from all over the world. And there was a lady there called Jo Dover, and she's the, she was a facilitator at the time uh, in in the Warrington Peace Centre where the, okay. uh, the two little Jonathan mm-hmm. Ball and Tim Parry were murdered by the IRA in Warrington. So it was a fabulous peace centre. And she said, you know, she said, I'd love if you came over to... Warrington for a residential. She yeah. said, it's not like anything you do now. It's not, you don't stand up at a podium and, mm. and tell, you know, tell your story mm. or, or mm. Uh, do a questions and answers. It said, it's just a case of you go in, you sit down on couches and you have a cup of coffee and six people in the room and you talk about your experience and see, you know, whether mm. there's worth in listening to each other's mm. stories. Of course there is. And she said, I want you there because I think you'd be really good to help other people mm. to get through their trauma mm-hmm. like you did mm. and of course you know being so confident that i had mm-hmm. that i was the one in a million or the 10 million mm-hmm. as the psychiatrist had said all those years back i thought you know okay joe i'll do that mm-hmm. so we went to and she said before you you come over to warrington she said i want you to bring a talisman which is some sort of a, an object mm-hmm. that would tie you and remind you that you can focus on something mm-hmm. that reminds you of the incident that mm-hmm. changed your life mm-hmm. So, uh, as usual, um, I'm last minute, as my wife often says, lastminute.com, you know, I was mm-hmm. just about to catch the flight mm-hmm. to, uh, to John Lennon Airport mm-hmm. in, in Liverpool, to, mm-hmm. which is closest to Warrington. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, I saw Tony's guitar, Tony Garrity, our guitar player, he had left a guitar string in my house mm-hmm. in South Tipperary when we stayed there for a couple of nights, himself and his fiancée mm-hmm. and Anne and, my, uh, and, and I, and... And we had a jam session. We invited all the friends over and we mm-hmm. were playing the blues and some jazz and, and uh, it was, we just had a night off. So it was great. And he changed his strings and he took off one of mm-hmm. the strings. And the usual thing is you take off the old string, you take out the new string, you put the old mm-hmm. one into the pouch of the new one. That's mm-hmm. it was just, you know, either for mm-hmm. to be tidy or else you never know when you might mm-hmm. need when you're short of string. Yes, yeah. So uh, I kept that in my office and... Uh, I said, I'll bring that handy. So I put it in my inside pocket and I went went to Warrington and I uh, met Joe and the other people that were there. And we're sitting around uh, like we are with them couches. We're, that evening we're drinking coffee and 
chatting and and uh, she said, well, let's talk about our experiences. And as you know, they, they get their, uh, the lighting is right, the ambience and everything is good mm. the way they do it, you know. Uh, mm. And um, so one by one, the people stood up and they, you know, they presented whatever their, uh, the talisman they had, mm. they had brought with them. And there was this particular man uh, and he said that he was, uh, he was, he had been a British soldier uh, he had served in Aden, not Northern Ireland, but he had served in Aden, and he had uh, he brought along a small toy fire engine, and he put it. Uh, you went over to this mm. sort of like sideboard, and you took the thing, and, and you put it in front of you, and you, and you explained why that was important in your life. Mm. And he said all he ever wanted to be in his life was a fireman. Mm. Since he was a kid, he wanted to be a fireman, but he had joined the. The army seen terrible things in Aden. He had been abused as a child. He had uh, abused alcohol and drugs. Mm. And this man was a wreck. Mm. He was he was in a bad way. Um, and every the more he spoke, the more I wanted to stand up and be my newfound stardom mm. and, and, mm. and 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 say, you know, I'm mm. going to say something really profound and mm. show this man how to get through his life. You mm. know, uh, and. So when it came to my turn, uh, I mean, this man had the shakes and everything. It came to my turn and Joe says, you know, do you want to introduce yourself, Stephen? And, this, and I was thinking to myself, you know, she's right. I'm the right person to be here to tell them how to, mm. you know, to sort themselves out. Mm. Now, this is 35 years after the incident, mm. after our incident. So I stood up and I said, yeah, my name is Stephen Travers. And I've brought, and I put my hand into my pocket, inside pocket of my jacket to take out Tony's guitar string and the wall fell on me mm. totally unexpected mm. I have no idea why it happened uh, my voice went I didn't know where I was um, mm. it was and I cried for the mm. first time mm. in 35 years the tears came down mm. now whether it had been triggered by the stories of the other people or whether it was some kind of divine intervention that gave me a reality mm. check whatever it was um, I couldn't function. Mm. And all of a sudden, you've got this man, this little British soldier that I have mm. feeling pity on, and he's got his arm around me and he's mm. saying, it'll be okay, you know, mm. it happens to everybody. Mm. And in my head, I'm saying, it doesn't happen to me, I'm one in a million. It doesn't, mm. this does not happen to me. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to push people away. But I was back in the field. Mm. I didn't know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't, uh, it was some kind of a, a breakdown. It took me, uh, it took me two years to, 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 to sort myself out mm. after that. It was, uh, it was a terrible experience. And, mm. it, and I remembered so much more. You remembered the actual incident from 35 yeah, years earlier. Because any of the talks that I ever gave, whether it was in Spain or, Mm -hmm. the Netherlands or wherever it was we had been in, in East Africa, wherever it was, I was able to come out of that body. I, was, I, I used to stand out of myself and watch this person at a microphone speaking mm -hmm. to people. And I could stand at the side of the stage and listen. Mm -hmm. And this person was going through the... But when this happened, ever since that, mm -hmm. the minute it happened, I, I, I got an empathy. Mm -hmm. And I fully understood what a victim was mm. and I understood what I was and I accepted mm. that I was a victim mm. and I was able to deal with it then mm. but it was a very very difficult thing to deal with well wow. yeah well thank you Stephen for sharing that um one of the definitions I've heard of reconciliation is it uses kind of four four words truth uh, mercy justice and peace um, as John Paul Lederach said, that that was his definition of, of reconciliation. He's one of these experts that has written about it and come over here in different parts of the world. But and according to him, um, you know, a reconciliation that doesn't have the truth is not not going to be reconciliation. You've got to have these four elements: truth, mercy, justice, and peace. Um, in your life, um, it seems like the, the the trajectory you're really on is is really elevating this word truth, which I think many times we want to just move on. Um, 
justice is another one. You know, um, let's not have to deal with that. Let's just have peace. And so you have a, a kind of a peace, but it's a it's an insufficient peace. You, you don't have any society societal um, transformation. You just kind of create bigger walls. You know, our peace walls in Belfast are bigger than they were when our peace agreement was signed. You know. Um, what do you think is the importance of truth and wh- how do you balance kind of things that have happened in the past with the need for truth to come out there? Is it about dealing with systemic problems? Is that why, what, what is the, what is truth for you and why is it important? Well, we call the organization Truth and Reconciliation Platform and truth comes before reconciliation mm-hmm. because we're, we absolutely believe that there can't be reconciliation mm. without the truth because, mm. say, if you think, if you really think your next door neighbor was the one that knocked down your dog mm. and killed your dog, you mm. know, you're not going to feel good about that person until they say, you know, I actually did that mm. and I'm sorry about it. Mm. Now, we don't look for, uh, you know, apologies uh, mm. it, because there are, are, we meet, we deal with, with victims all the time and, and, uh, I, th- I think we're quite a special organization because it, we are an organization set up by victims, for victims, mm-hmm. so that we have this understanding, this empathy. Mm-hmm. I'm just about to be uh, a great honor. I've been I've asked to be the keynote speaker at the at the Bloody Sunday commemoration, mm-hmm. uh, the first Thursday, uh, first Monday, in, uh, first Sunday in in uh, in February this year. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I can I can actually look at the people. In Derry, mm. and say, mm. you know, I, I, I know your pain. Mm. I feel your pain. Mm. I understand. Now there are, you know, there are plenty of things that I'm not qualified to deal with. Uh, but without the truth, and uh, uh, without the truth, there can't be reconciliation. Mm. With regard to justice, I'm not that bothered about that, mm. you know. But I know it's very, very important. Uh, I know it's very, very important mm. because. Um, and, and we must be bothered about it. Mm. We should be bothered about it, um, because unless unless there's justice, now I don't mean revenge. Mm. I don't mean somebody no. you know somebody being punished. I don't, I never ever want to see or mm. hear of anybody else suffering on mm. account of the Miami uh, incident. Mm. That is not this. Mm. As my wife said at the time, I remember somebody, she was only 21 years old and, and somebody came to her when I, it was the day I was being taken from Daisy Hill Hospital down down south in the ambulance. And somebody came along and said to her, you know, he said, don't worry, we'll get the people that did this. And at 21 years of age, this mm. traumatized mm. young girl turned around to that person and said, there's been enough. Pe- there's been enough mm. killing. There's been enough people mm. uh, injured and, and suffering on account of this. And she mm. didn't want to know and no more than I did. So the justice is a difficult one, mm. but there must be. Ju- we've we've taken a case. The Miami families and and uh, we've taken a case against the British government, against mm. the chief constable of the PSNI, uh, because of we believe that they uh, that the RUC their predecessors acted in concert with them and mm. in in collusion with them and also with the. Uh, with the ministry against the mm. ministry for defense because of the involvement of mm. FRU, the MI5, mm. um, the, the UDR, all of these things because they armed and supported them and covered it up. All of these things. Sure, we're taking a case, mm. but the, the the end result of this justice has to be has to be that often people say justice needs to be seen to be done, and it has to be because. It's the system that I'm taking to, to uh, I, I'm, yeah. I, I want to be yeah. held, held account for this. The system, yeah. it, it has to change. Yeah. It has to change because if we don't go into the yeah. courts, and this is where I suppose we're talking about justice, yeah. if we don't go into the courts yeah. and show this up for the folly that it is and show it up for the injustice that it was at the time, yeah. you know, uh, um, because we hear all the time the excuses that they give. Well, we had to make it worse before we make mm. it better, and this was their strategy and all mm. this. End of the day is they, uh, the mm. British system murdered its own citizens. Mm. It, uh, we had mm. some of our lads were were from born and bred in the north, and and they murdered the citizens. It's an act mm. of war against mm. the citizens of uh, of, of mm. uh, against a neighbouring friendly state. I mean, mm. they attacked. They attack the citizens. This is—it's an outrage. And now, as I say, mm. with the now that we know 
uh, the the identity of the of the British Army officer, and he was very very well known, and he certainly was not under any circumstances uh, was he uh, a renegade. He was mm. following orders. So all of this, unless you pursue that, and unless you get you know justice, that to me mm. is justice. Mm. But no, I don't want anybody. If that yeah. uh, you know, if the people and we know there are other people who were never charged, and mm. if they came in here and sat down, I'd have a cup of coffee with them. At the, mm. I wouldn't feel. I wouldn't feel, you know, in any way, sort of, any kind of ill will to mm. them. In fact, I felt for a long time that, uh, you know, a bit abnormal because everybody was saying to me, you know, that they, they would, you know, say nasty things about the people who did it. And I could never feel like that. Mm. I could never feel. So I remember when we were, uh, Neil Felsen Hall and I were writing the book in 2007 and we had an opportunity to meet the leadership mm. of the UVF and I thought, at last, I'm going to face this organization that, that you know, we're part mm. of this. And I was hoping that I would feel normal and I, mm. that I would be able to hate them. Mm. And I remember looking at this man. Mm. And no matter what I, how hard I tried, I couldn't dislike mm. this man. You know, I just couldn't dislike him. Mm. Uh, um, it's, I see them, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a, mm. people wouldn't like us to say it, but you, they were radicalized. Mm. People on both sides were radicalized mm. to the extent that that they thought, you know, killing somebody mm. is all right because it's for us, mm. it's, it's, it's mm. for a cause. Yeah, I don't believe that it's all right to do it because mm. when and this is where TARP is so important. TARP says to you know, uh, what TARP does is as it says, you know what, you've got a story to tell. It's a very valuable story. Mm. There's a platform. Mm. Get up there and tell mm. it. I was listening to a, a, a program on BBC Radio Ulster. It's a program called Stephen Nolan Show. I listen to it on online because it's mm. on South. You can't. It's not or regular. And it's a bit of a bear pit, to be mm. honest with you. You know, people yes, yeah, a lot uh, of shouting, a lot yeah. of shouting at each other. Yeah. But one, I was on it myself there a couple of times. I once, I think, I can't remember, but. Um, and there was this lady on, I can't remember whether she was nationalist or, or unionist or Catholic or Protestant, it didn't matter. But she said something that struck me. She said, she told a story about her husband mm. being killed 40 odd years ago. Mm. And she said uh, to Stephen Nolan, she said, you know, Stephen, she said, yesterday, she said, before I spoke about my husband on this program, she said, mm. I was nobody. And my husband was nobody. Mm. Today, I'm somebody and mm. my husband is somebody. Mm. And I thought, you know, the Miami, we're, we're a high profile scale. We're one of the highest profiles, especially mm. since the Netflix documentary. Mm. I mean, people from, mm -hmm. we've, you know, all over the world, yeah. had to, we were trending and mm. all over the world within 24 hours of the thing being. Mm. But people, there, we're only one, one case out of 3,700 mm. mm. killings mm. and tens of thousands, something like 40,000 injuries mm. that happened up there mm. that destroyed people's lives. And they don't get an opportunity. Mm. And it is so important, as that lady said, mm. that to be recognized, to be, I mean, mm. you know, uh, this, is, this is, gives us a mm. whole new lease of life. And I hope... Mm that we can, I can continue with Eugene mm. Reevy, people of mm. that stature, mm. with people like Joe Campbell, mm. people like Alan McBride, mm. all of those great people mm. that uh, for, for, the, for as long mm. as uh, God gives me breath mm. that, that I can do this mm. because it's, uh, it's, it, it is so, it, it, gives, it gives us a sense of worth. I think mm. it's, um, uh, and I, we, we hope to set up a, a peace centre mm. Uh, and uh, the, the people in TARP have been very, very good. And they've mm. said, you know, let's call it uh, the Miami Shoban Peace mm. Centre because it mm. personifies the mm. lads were Catholics and Protestants north mm. south without a sectarian bone their bodies. Mm. And, and to be able to highlight the stories and to tell the stories so that another generation won't, mm. uh, won't be radicalised into doing this. Yeah, I think what you're describing, Stephen, is, is kind of, I think is really beautiful, you know, uh, is, you know, it's, Maybe you could call it uh, restorative justice. You know, it's a, 
I think through what you're describing, through your life, the way you're living with the Truth and Reconciliation platform, you very much, I see truth, mercy, justice, peace all over yourself, you know, and I think it's for that reason, I think you are becoming a transformative voice uh, in the country and we need that, you know, um, more than ever, I suppose, you know, as we try to rebuild a sense of government here in Northern Ireland and try to make our way back um, from a kind of the last few years where it's it's we've been in a, a stalemate here. So one of the things that you've done uh, or you're doing is the Truth and Reconciliation platform, which is, is you know, where you bring together people uh, from all sides to share their stories and there's large public gatherings. But you also do that in schools. What, what, is, we do. what does it look like? Um, well, I think uh, a very important thing to say about TARP is, um, is that it, it tells the stories, it allows people to tell the stories mm. in their own voice, the mm. victims and vi their their loved ones. And um, <laughs> any one of these stories, any one of these stories held up in isolation can be used as a stick to beat the other side mm. with. I say the other side advisedly. Mm. It can be used, but once you tell them in tandem, once 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 there's a balance and there has mm. to be a balance, mm. and that's part of our the makeup of TARP. Mm. But we were doing a, an event in the city hotel in Derry one time. And uh, remember there was a Q&A at the end, the mm. questions and answers at the end. And there was, one of the questions was, why didn't we speak to young people? Mm. Why didn't we go into schools? And mm. it's not something that we had, you know, we were, mm. we, we had considered it, but it's not something mm. that, that we, we felt would be safe because uh, very traumatic, you know. Uh, you could traumatize people mm. uh, easily by, and we thought, well, you know, if if we were to do schools, we'd have to do it maybe universities or the older people that would be mature enough to listen to this. And the parents in Derry became very animated, mm. and they insisted. They said, "Look, unless you talk to." the 11 and 12 year olds. Mm. These are the kids that are being radicalized and that are, they're out on the street with the bottles and the, and the bricks and everything thrown at mm. them at the, uh, at the, in the riots. Mm. And they insisted that we did. So we mm. considered it. Um, I know Eugene was reluctant. I was certainly reluctant, but we went back to the panel mm. and we asked, and we, so we decided that we would go back to the Department of Foreign Affairs who gave us a certain amount of funding and we asked them about it. And so they funded us to the extent that we were able to go into, into schools. Mm. Rory uh, O'Hanlon, uh, the former Keon Corley, mm. he was of great assistance in that. Mm. And uh, we went into schools and we spoke to, to young people and we were very surprised uh, uh, they engaged, they asked very intelligent questions. But one of the things about uh, speaking to young people is that you can't expect them, you can't expect them to value the peace. So they're easily radicalized in that mm. respect. Um, how can they value the peace uh, mm. uh, that they have now if mm. they don't know what it's like mm. not to have peace? They take it for granted. They yeah. take it for granted like we mm. did. And then it catches up on you. Uh, mm. uh, and all of a sudden you're, 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 you're right in the center of it. Um, so we, we decided, you know what, we'll tell them what it's like. Mm -hmm. We'll tell them, we'll tell them, you know, that there is no glamour in this. We'll mm -hmm. tell them that regardless of what they, what they, what they're told by people who try to ra radicalize them mm -hmm. and use them cynically, um, you know, if you watch a movie and you're a cowboy, a Western movie or whatever, and somebody gets shot and he puts his hand up and says, ouch, and falls down, mm. that's not the way it happens. Mm. Mm. And so the stories that, uh, from the very stories from the, the Reavy brothers' stories and the horror that he had to encounter when he walked into mm. see his three brothers mm. murdered, the, um, the, the stories of people like Paul Michael mm. Wayne, all of these terrible stories, they're shocking. Mm. But... And necessary. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably the less of two evils. Yeah. You know, that, uh, and so our schools program mm -hmm. is very, very important. And uh, we, can we, we will continue, we'll mm -hmm. develop that, uh, the, the, our mm -hmm. schools program where kids are told the reality of violence. Yeah, and it's amazing to hear that you could be sharing your stories in front of 
three, four hundred kids from from Protestant Catholic schools, and uh, it's brilliant. The teachers and principals are behind that, and yeah, it's an important message that needs to be heard. Yeah, and we're, we're we are very grateful to the to the teachers and the principals in these schools and the boards of governors mm. in these schools, who are courageous enough mm. to say, uh, you know, mm. come and, and do this. We'll be part of this. Mm. Oh, it is. A bit like an experiment. Mm. The other thing that we did, uh, because it's so easy for groups like us, mm. uh, for groups uh, who tell these stories, mm. to to preach to the converted. Mm. You know, mm. you can you can go down to into your own into your own community. Yes. Mm. You can tell these stories, and everybody pats you on the back, and you sign your mm. books or whatever. But we've been uh, the people that are that are in top. Mm. They never cease to amaze me. That they've been. Courageous. They've gone out and they've gone into into areas that would be mm-hmm. fairly partisan, mm. uh, to say the least. Uh, and they've stood up there and they've told mm. their stories. And mm. the amazing thing is that the respect they mm. get mm. from people that mm. they were perhaps worried mm. about talking to. But uh, look, TARP is the most... Mm. Uh, I have to perhaps um, mm. uh, uh, quote Seamus Mallon. Mm. And he is uh, one of the giants of the mm. uh, of, of of recent Irish history. He said it is the most powerful thing that I've been involved in. Mm. In what did he in many a year? He said. He said I've been mm. tarp truth and reconciliation platform. Mm. He said I am delighted. He said it's given me a new sense of uh, a, a new lease of life. And this was after mm. his his wife Gertrude had died. And he said it's a new purpose, a new lease of life. Mm. And it is the most mm. powerful project I've been involved in in many a year mm. and Dr. Rory O'Hanlon said the mm. same thing and we were just with him last night and he said you must continue with this mm. the work is is is, is essential mm-hmm. so we're very proud of TARP yeah brilliant brilliant um, uh, we'll just f- finish this now um, but maybe just uh, sure, in a little bit later we're going to interview Tommy Sands who I know you've you've met and uh, He's done an event. He does an event here at least once a year called the Music of Healing. Yeah. Um, and you know, one of Tommy's things, obviously, is that music has this capacity to really heal, to again to transcend yeah. um, politics and dividing lines and stuff. Um, what's your kind of uh, that kind of? How do you kind of see that as the music is a healing? Um, presence in a society and and what kind of society do you think Northern Ireland should be or all of Ireland you know well music is uh, when I play music whether it's with uh, um, any of my old friends or somebody new I mean I'm just about to do a an event with uh, with Jim Deeds in the Four Corners and we were playing mm-hmm. guitars earlier on mm-hmm. it is it is the only time that I am the person that I was before the incident. Mm. It is the, it, it, it's when, well, I remember thinking to myself one time, I, I played with my great friend Johnny Fien from a band called Horse Lips. And uh, Johnny and I, yeah, we, we put a band together where uh, it was totally free. We didn't know what was going to happen. The only thing we knew was certain about it was the count. The counting. Somebody says one, two, three, four. <laughs> After that, you know, we knew what key we were in, and but we had this freedom. It was an mm. amazing freedom. It wasn't very commercial as you can imagine, but people loved it. And mm. there's, you know, it was almost somebody called it Celtic jazz. I don't know, you know, if you put a label on it, then you're restricted. But uh, the music, not just healing, it's it transforms you. You become the person. Mm. It could imagine no matter what's wrong with you, once you're in this thing, mm. you're actually aquaplaning. You're not on the mm. ground anymore, mm. you know. It's it's the most fabulous feeling you mm. can imagine, you know. Mm. And it's a way of expressing yourself that, mm. that words words just don't mm. do it for, you know. And it's a gift mm. uh, that to be able, the gift of music mm. is simply this, is that it's another, it's another way of articulating how you feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember, I think it was B.B. King, the great blues player, uh, said, you know, you got to feel really good to play the blues, mm-hmm. you know, which mm-hmm. sort of sounds mm-hmm. a bit like a contradiction, mm-hmm. but that's how important it is. And with the music, if you can actually, if you're good enough, uh, uh, not just at playing the music, because the guys who can barely play three chords, mm-hmm. but they can actually they can impose this feeling on an audience mm. and it's magic. Mm. You know, look at 
Bob Dylan uh, mm-hmm. in front of uh, when when he did the the, the uh, Martin Luther King thing. I mm-hmm. think he was sing "Blowing in the Wind" or something mm-hmm. like that. Handful of chords, mm-hmm. and here he is, and the power of that, not just mm-hmm. on the day, but right down through the mm-hmm. the the, the, uh, the mm-hmm. generations and the certainly the decades. Or you watch the people on the old clips, uh, the that are uh, were. Uh, Civil rights movement mm-hmm. in that church and the scene we shall overcome. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that, but that's the power. Mm-hmm. Johnny Cash mm-hmm. had it. You know, you don't have to be a virtuoso to do mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. It's it's just it's the music, uh, whatever way it is, whether it's reggae, whether mm-hmm. it's uh, you know, uh, Marley had this magic as well. Mm-hmm. It's about connecting the mm-hmm. spirit mm-hmm. of of all of the people, the audience and the person themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, the better you are, the better you're able to do that. Yeah, so uh, yeah. that's the, that's the power of the music. And with mm-hmm. regard to uh, uh, how I see a New Ireland, um, I certainly, you know, being I'm a, I'm a committed nationalist. I would mm-hmm. love to see United mm-hmm. Ireland. I I think it's the right mm-hmm. thing to do because mm-hmm. Britain doesn't certainly doesn't care about the people in the north. Uh, we have far more in common uh, than we have that divides us. Mm-hmm. I hope uh, um, you know that. Uh, Ireland can become like a really good gig, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That uh, well, I think the way you described it, I mean, it's phenomenal to hear the number of bands that you you mentioned at the beginning of this interview that were. I mean, I, I've got a friend who, who works in music and uh, in, in culture and in, in Belfast, and in a constant lament he has is the lack of funding that's been put into the arts and. You know, you know, there's an Australian writer who passed away earlier this year. John Smith said, "Art is the is the nerve ending of a society." You know, and if you don't have art, you don't have music. It's almost like we don't know how to feel. You know, and I think, I think, music gives us a, a, the capacity to heal and to know what we're feeling and thinking. Otherwise, it's like we're we're just uh, anesthetized. To- so some people, some people, when you look at the at the makeup of a ca- the cabinet in any government. The arts minister is usually the guy that they don't really bother with. Mm. You know, he's the mm. guy. He's the guy that's well. We have to tolerate him. Mm. Whereas, art, mm. it should be at the very top. And the reason for that is mm. that it is a special mm. way of communicating. Mm. It is, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a whole new voice mm. that if we can harness it, if we can listen to it, mm. look at the beauty that you know, um, that that can come come out of even during conflict. You have, mm. you know, there are people that can stand up and. Mm. I think uh, Silent Night is probably mm. the, the the one mm. in the middle of the you know the mm-hmm. the First World War. Mm. I don't know how accurate that story is, mm. but mm. it's a beautiful story. But it united these two yeah, warring groups. It did, yeah, groups, it yeah. did, and that was the great thing. I think the greatest mm. legacy you can possibly have is what the show bands left behind them. The show bands uh, um, um, were are able to stand up, and, and you know, you remember the, the there was a film on what did you do in the war, Daddy? Mm-hmm. Well, if you're a show, if you're in a show band, what you did in the war was you brought people together, mm-hmm. and that's that's what I'm really really mm-hmm. proud of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, Stephen Travers, thank you so much for your time with us. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the, the work you're doing with Eugene and the Truth and Reconciliation Platform is just brilliant, and it's needed. Uh, we need to hear your voice, your story, and there's so many other stories out there that we need to hear. And um, you're bringing truth to life, which is not always easy, but you're doing it in a way not to punish, but to restore and to rebuild society so we don't have these systemic kind of injustices going on. So thank you for your work. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, we pray God's blessing on you as you keep doing that work and breaking down walls through telling the truth. Thanks, Thank Jay. you, Stephen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.